Now we're doing uh, crowd dynamics. Cool. And this isn't much. If you model from the bottom up, this is very simple. If I had to describe that as a fluid with a couple different equations, it'd be very difficult. Right? So, so now that can scale up. And now we're just, this was on a 2D raster, my data with some obstacles. But now you can bring in GIS a two and a half D. If you think of all the, the corridors and the rows on here, this was for Homeland Security, and there was a dirty bomb uh, in the stadium, simulating the evacuation at PNC. I'm from Cleveland, so I got to pick a stadium. <laughs> this is, uh, in Pittsburgh. Very pretty stadium, terrible team. <laughs> and so now this was back uh, using Java and processing, but now this runs in the browser. Uh, so here's a detonation at third base, right field, and then home plate. Hmm. And now we're simulating with a, kind of a flood fill. We start from all the exits and flood hmm. the, your distance to an exit on the graph. And that's when an agent comes into an intersection, it's like a bunch of signposts, mm -hmm. and they decide which way to go. So every agent doesn't have to do routing, because if you had 70,000 agents trying to do a route, it's very expensive. Here we're storing the routing information in the graph. Cool. Uh, here's a dirty bomb at uh, Petco during the All-Star game, and we're now, so now the particles could be horizontally dispersing and vertically dispersing, and then using the LiDAR data to constrain where they can go. Right. And, and then we have a traffic model, and in this era you can bring an open street map for any area. Hmm and have evacuations or things like that, right? Or here's, uh, so here's Petco with clay instead of sand, because now you can get a different angle of repose. You know, you can get concave surfaces. So we call this digital printing with your digits. <laughs> but think of, think of that, Sean. So just, just phone, digital grabbing, squeezing. Phone, phone and projector gives you scanning, but it also gives you printing. And with different material sciences, then you can bake it and you got a part. And that's cool. And we're not, you know, we're not having to get a lot of hardware in the middle. Totally. So someone could come in with exactos and be guided by the light. And so make this one taller, make that one shorter to match the lighter. And then then we put the GIS on top of it. Right. So uh, with Pradeep uh, Sen, this was a we called this outside. This was an NSF project called Outside the Dome. So when you do dome projection. Uh, you have to warp your projections, but it's expensive to get that room set up, right? And you have the allosphere down at US, UCSB. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so think of this room. So imagine I'm projecting in the corner of this room like this, but, it's, but where my eyeball is right now, this is a very straight line, but for you guys, it's, it probably is. That's hidden, right, that's right? right. So there's a sweet spot. So if I hold up my camera from over here, we can go through that calibration process and warp it in the browser, right? So think about, here's the corner of a room, and here's H.264 video going through a browser uh -huh. in the corner. The projector's over here, and you got, you know, the camera's right here, and you see the distortion. Right. But if you hold up the camera and warp it, uh, or go through a structured light algorithm, then we can warp it on the fly <laughs> with WebGL. <laughs> that's cool. And that's the same video playing, and you can see that we've kind of, this is pretty straight. And then with cameras, you can also then add more blue, right, do color correction. And that's what I mean that uh, I think you're going to have much, uh, and interact, because the camera's involved, that means this is a, you know, we could actually start drawing stuff on that door and make stuff happen, right? Um, here's a city, and for Boston, for DHS, this was a dirty bomb scenario before the marathon. And think of now the calibration problem of an unknown projector with, say, Google Earth or Falcon View or Esri Globe. When you fly around, you're flying a virtual camera. And that camera has nine degrees of freedom. Three for position, X, Y, Z. Three for your rotations, yaw, pitch, and roll. A focal length, and then two lens distortions. Same thing on your drone, right? Your camera has nine. You can hmm. tune your camera more than that, but that's pretty good, right? You can probably get away with just assuming a good lens, too. The, uh, the other important ones are your principal point on a lens. So if you look at this lens, most projectors, the principal point's at the bottom 
if you come, yeah, come look at the image on that lens, right? Hmm. Notice that it's on the top half of the lens. Hmm. So, so, and also, you look here, the Im if you look at how the image is on the lens, so that's, because most projectors are designed to sit on the table and project up. Right. Because that, but most cameras, the principal point's in the middle, and it uses the whole lens, right? So different lenses, different optics will have different principal points. So that's a, uh, so let's call that 11 degrees of freedom, the X and Y of the principal point. So if we can, if we can project on here, and imagine having a second screen on Google Earth and saying this point here is this lat long in elevation in Google Earth. Then you can do a linear algebra of these squares uh, solve for those 11 degrees of freedom. What projection matrix, and this is homogeneous coordinates, so it's kind of like polar coordinates, what projection matrix projects that out into the world with the least error? And, you, and it's just a search problem. Hmm. So here's uncalibrated, and here's a projector looking on the Boston Commons, we're looking forward. And then here's, uh, then we'll, we have these points, and then we solve for the virtual camera <laughs> cool. going through an unknown projector. <laughs> and now things line up. And so now this could be live drone footage. Yeah. This could be your, all your DOT cameras. Yep, yep, yep. And then we call this live texture. So texture mapping in 3D graphics is the pixels you put on the model. So we call it live texture. This whole thing we're building, we're going to call real-time Earth, which includes the modeling, the uh, project, any surface is projecting in the world. Live texture is the models, and then the asakia is how you manage the data. The whole thing we call hmm. real-time Earth. Hmm. Um, so here's now me flying into San Diego. On my phone browser, I can get at the sensors, including with GP. The GPS also gives me an estimate of. Altitude. Z, right, yeah. It's not as good as your barometer, so you get both. But in an airplane, you're pressurized anyway. Yeah, yeah. So you're, uh, I could be off by 100 feet with my GPS altitude. Uh, the GGIs will give you both, right? Yeah. Uh, but here now is I'm in the browser, bringing in the elevation, and projecting my position onto <laughs> the model. <laughs> That's cool. So, and then, and then think of it going the other way with all your game cameras. So the SD comes back into the lab. Uh, and now some people find a couple points of reference and we're solving for that so that every pixel in every camera image has a real coordinate. And then imagine someone now comes along and says, okay, I saw a deer here. We got coverage over here. And then it's gonna be ghost simulations. Right. Of Particles right. of where it could right. potentially go. That's cool. Following contours, and where do I need to get the next observation? That's super cool, right? So here's uh, for you know, we lost 19 firefighters in Yarnell uh, when this fire happened. And let me just take you back to also to give you the context. So I'll, oh, by the way, well before I do, because we're on uh, here. So here's the few, like for instance, right now we're going to Nature Conservancy and pulling up uh, the vegetation of this area, right? So the nice thing is we're in an era where this stuff is available on the web. Yes. So I just pulled an area of interest. Uh, I'm picking an area and, and, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I mean it's available, but it's at 30 meter resolution. Right. But you guys got much better fuels, but then do yep. some machine yep. learning yep. and vision to yep. start Fill classifying better than yep. this. Yep. But you can use their data against what you're seeing, especially multispectral on your drones, not just the visible. You got infrared and uh, ultraviolet and and uh, VDI and DVI or N NDVI. And DVI. And DVI. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, so that's another one. Then we have slope for the area. And here's just a basic uh, four. So imagine putting a water particle here yeah. on a checkerboard. Yeah. And now it's going to look at its four, uh, eight neighbors and go downhill up to one of them. You know, and it'll pick one of them randomly. How fast it moves downhill is based on the slope. Cool. Right. So here's some, some microbursts in the browser. Right? Yeah. I mean, you think about, think about um, um, uh, Montecito, right? I mean, exactly. being able to do that right with the, those incoming storms. Yeah, and I met with them the week uh, after that because, and this, we're, we're, Nate and I were talking, 
<clears throat> ultimately, the citizens need to have the information to evacuate, not be told. Exactly. To and they have the intel. So how do you how do you bring all that together in real time? In AR view, when you're holding up, if I'm sitting on this mountain, I could know that, oh, I'm away from, this is where the debris flow is going to be. I don't need to evacuate. <laughs> Man, that would be crazy. Fire, yeah. Crazy. And like, the more people that are observing, yeah. the more data you have. That's awesome. Which we'll show in a second. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so, 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 so the analogy of the real-time traffic cameras, right? When people are getting the real-time traffic reporting, it's just in this case, it would be a natural exactly. disaster but, feed. And, and think about DO, the Department of Transportation has all these traffic cams, but they don't know traffic as well as Google. Why right. Do, why does right. Google know traffic better than the DOT? And a thousand million cams. data points real-time. Because they give information to people. Yep. They have the data points, because I'm navigating with Google, they know how fast I'm moving and where the congestion is. So think about what do you give to the people to get your observation. Don't ask them to go observe for you. Give them in, give them something. What do they want to see? And it doesn't have to be what you're asking for. You have to be transparent that this is what you're using it for. But they may want to be playing Pokemon or some kind of thing, and you're putting Pokemon where you need to have a deer sighting. Right, and you can we can make it easy to do spatial modeling. It's a whole other kind of citizen science. Yes, it's like it's like not not actively or, yeah. or they don't necessarily know what they're collecting. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Well, yeah, and we were on NSF when we were doing a thing with street funk where the, uh, the accelerometers of your uh, phone? phone was mapping the roads, right? <laughs> and then when we we're at, uh, NSF asked everyone that was doing an NSF project with mobile phones that year to come together, and we and we call it we, the idea of citizen pipe is the idea that. You don't want to make an app for every channel of information someone researcher wants to collect. Just because I'm taking a photo, there's 30 different researchers that can use that particular data. It might be Project Budburst of right. when, when, or leaves, or right. bird calls. Microphones can triangulate where the birds are. There's all kinds of uses. And so how do we build up a surveillant? This is a cute term out of MIT. But you brush this in your uh, PhD thesis. <laughs> so this is uh, so. Th how do you do a surveillance compliant system? That's a very fundable word. Surveillance compliant system. That sounds very important. Yeah. So this is uh, Steve Mann's fifth grade daughter. Uh, wrote this here. Let's see if this. Oh, let me come out of full screen here. Let's see. Let me get out of this guy here. Fighting, uh, yeah, so it's surveillance is from above. <laughs> Sue is bottom up. <laughs> like a sous chef. He's below the master chef. Nice. Emily is the Sue master of this department. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> she makes everything happen. Right? That's right. So think of observation and citizen science from this perspective. We don't want to, you know, people don't trust camera, you know, just like, what yep. is this? Especially yep. if you're in government, right? Yep. Uh, so, and I don't want to live in a big brother world. None of us do. Right. I don't want to put all my video up on Google Photos then that I get some 2% of the value. So imagine if a fire was happening on that hill over there. Uh, let's just say... So, uh, so we're going to go ahead and start a fire now. And again, this is a very basic cellular automata model with those six factors. Here's a wind vector, strength and direction up on the top left. You can't uh, you can see it here. Cool. Right, so that's the strength and direction of the vector. And we're in the browser here. That's amazing. And before I uh, even do that, let me uh, bring up the console in the browser for a developer. Just to show you, these days, uh, the code for this, you know, this is this is the program, right? And you, you don't uh, in JavaScript, you don't have to uh, worry about too much about what that is. But the point is, the whole thing is not running on a server, right? And then, more importantly to me, is this: the data itself, all of the GIS tiles that we need, are stored and cached locally, and they can be shared peer to peer to whoever else needs it for what they need it for. And I don't need to give them the data, I can give them the information. Like, if you did photogrammetry with all the images, 
I don't need your textures, I just need the height. And that's a kind of a surveillant thing. Hmm. So you're saying you just need the XYZ information? Yeah, of, of the picture. I don't need to know the color. The subset that's relevant to whatever your task is. Okay. And so people can then say, uh, or imagine there's a fire on this hill and the someone that has an is an authority can warrant maybe let me just close this so let's not go back to full screen here so we're going to start a fire right here and by the way the sand really helps because you can look at this topo map right but even an expert it, it takes them 10 totally. percent of their brain so if I start it here, that's kind of easier, but if I started it right here, you know, you're like, okay, it's going to come up in here, yeah. maybe peek out here. But if it was on the sand, it'd be very clear of what the uphill meant, right? Uh, so let's come back to the hybrid here. And now we'll start a fire right in here and blow it with the winds coming out of the west. That's okay. cool. And we'll speed up time a little bit. But now because we have all the roads in the area, we can just brush those people <laughs> and the speed limits. Oh my God. Right? And that's not a sophisticated thing either. If you think of a road network as a graph, right? And everything in GIS is piecewise linear. There are no curves. So everything's a little line. So when a, car's, a car comes to an, a, a node, it looks at all outgoing nodes and picks one and just points towards it and drives at some delta uh, time or delta uh, distance until it gets within some range and then picks the next one. And that's all you have to do for traffic. Okay? And that's something that can be very uh, quick. So imagine now you were sitting here looking out of the lab with our cameras and they're, uh, so they're fighting this fire here. Let's just say they're bringing in a dozer and they're digging line. And that, that dozer production rate is going to be a function of slope and uh, fuel. Or here comes the aircraft that's going to be uh, maybe working on this left uh, flank. Okay. So if we speed up time. And now, if you guys have a QR reader, mm -hmm. uh, on, on an iPhone, just open your camera. On Android, you need a bar, uh, barcode scanner, but go ahead and grab that. Fine. I'm going vi to video your phone so we get to see what it looks like. So that's cool. So this is the fire that we just created on your I mean, Emily's phone. Right, and now Emily is now, imagine she's putting in uh, uh, an evacuation. You know, she's with the police. So she's going to um, put an evacuation area in here. And given what the fire department's telling her, she's going to bring these people here out west and now they're, eva no, they're evacuating right there. that's cool and this is peer-to-peer -peer browsers with different without the problem of the server and the you know who can hack it now i might now i have permission on my uh phone and so that's like someone on a, on a, on a student team is working together or maybe um yeah so i'll come in on my phone here and edit what Emily put because I'm. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just going to change. I'm just going to expand it. The fire's grown, right? Uh huh. And so now that's expanded. Awesome. Right. So, man, so, this is crazy stuff. Thanks. Now, now think. Look, so now we can also look at things. I mean, this is totally crazy stuff, dude. Let's get. We're in sync, right? This is what you do. I mean, I know, I know, but, but, but this is like science fiction, it seems to me. I mean, I mean, it's so far forward. And it's in our pockets. I, and you think of how, how, like, Hurricane Florence right now, this, like, crazy crap, when we get in the dark. This is, this could just change every, I mean, change so much in terms of disaster response and effective management and all these things. Yeah. This is awesome. And so, yeah, so on the management side, yes, uh, well, let's just look at, like, uh, other kind of, so here's a hazmat, right? So we're going to now model. <laughs> now you're speaking Emily's language. <laughs> so let's, um, I'm just going to hide the cars. Because if I speed up time, they look uh, like 
uh, too much chance. But they are still calculating, right? So if I go this fast, they're just distracting. Right, right, right. At 2,000 times real time. <clears throat> but again, it's not complicated once you, and this is Seymour Papert at MIT and the whole logo approach. If you think from the perspective of the individual and their interactions, it's a very natural way of modeling. If you try to say, what's the flow through a pipe network, that can get complicated very quickly. So again, these cars are just coming to an intersection and picking another, right now they're random walkers, except for where Emily put them, uh, that evacuation area. And mm -hmm. now we're doing a flood fill on them, just like this, uh, the agents in the sports stadium. So how about some more cars in here? Well, first of all, if they hit fire, they're dead. Like, <laughs> like the Oakland Berkeley fire. <laughs> right, right, right. Sean and my generations, that was a pink. I thing. remember that. That's what's right where I lived. Or what's the nearby lived. Do you know that? Uh, no. Dead end. Dead end. So these are dead ends. Yeah. <laughs> Sean and I, that was our <laughs> All right, so imagine now a protect uh, a plume. So given what I've told you, how would you model a chlorine particle? Ooh, jeez. Sniffers, I guess? Huh? Uh, I guess dispersion. Yeah, right, right, right. With wind. Oh, well, we yeah. have to have wind. So I'm going to put a little particle out there that'll be biased to go down wind, okay. just like the water. Okay. And the only difference with this is it's going to have a horizontal random walk mm -hmm. and a vertical random walk. And then I'll have a parameter of are you heavier than air or not, the vapor density. And if I am, then don't, I can't go around that, so I have to, uh, so there's a, so I, so now if I have a release, let me uh, hide my uh, cars, just for, so I'm not visually distracted by them. So here's something we're doing with Missoula. Uh, So we showed this here earlier. So here's a you know, drone flight over the Santa Fe rail yard. Right? So you guys are capturing things like this. Back in the day, we put this into photo scan, which is like your PIX4D. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my son did a, a tilt shift in a yeah, It looks cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, put some of his music on it. But another important thing is there's enough features in here so that when the next camera comes in, you can store those features to register to other cameras. So I think it's very important for pre-planning the students. What do you mean to register on other cameras? Uh, so if I bring this over here, uh, I'll show it here. So, so here's a machine vision in the browser. And this is a, a new term called the AR cloud, which is misnamed, we were talking on the phone. Okay. And it's, it's the idea that we're not really sure exactly where your camera is or some camera on social media, but if we really store the uh, machine vision, you can find corners and things like that. And then there's certain feature detectors. And if you look yeah. at 256 around it, right. and say, is it brighter or darker? Mm -hmm. Then it's uniquely specified at a certain zoom, right? And if you get three or five or 11 of these, you can solve for a camera. So the whole AR game hmm. is, where's my camera? Right. Then you can overlay very accurately the data. So this AR cloud is gonna be very, very important. And also something that can be shared without sharing the imagery. So right now, so this, if you just Google AR cloud, you can kind of read about that. Uh, and it's just the importance for sharing that. Google's doing it when you come out of, uh, you know, they have Street View, so like that. So they analyze that, and, and it looks like this. So when I say features, I mean these things. So here's um, th this is a fast corner. It's called fast because it's um, how it f how fast it finds corners and then the unique IDs around them, right? Oh my gosh! All right, so yeah, right cool. now on Nate, and I bring up the threshold. These are all uniquely specified yeah. points that if I came back into this room, I the camera could find them and solve for where the camera is. Or the way that works here too is if uh, here would be, and Dr. Kanati was in our office the other day, and I got to run 
Lucas Kanade on Dr. Kanade. <laughs> uh, so notice here, now those are uniquely identified. And I'm mad, but notice here that would pick up wow. motion because wow. that's moving on the projector. Wow. Or is this moving, right? Wow. But the fact that that can run in a phone or a browser, and then how those things cluster, then you go into deep learning, right? So here's TensorFlow has been the range, but now it's in the browser. I mean, when you can do the training in the cloud with all your data, but now, now we have, we've learned what a pose is, and this is a 2011 laptop, 2012. We'll let that run. Get my phone over here. It's Emily. Emily's dancing. And that's without depth and bad lighting. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, oh man. And there's other tensor flows to recognize certain kinds of objects for certain points. So here's a, uh, right? And this is pretty bad lighting in here. Yeah, it's horrible lighting. Well, I mean, because we, you know, are using the projector. So here's, but here's my eyes and my ears. Wow. Right? And it can handle hundreds of poses simultaneously. Um, you know, we, oh yeah, right? So, so another cute thing you can do with just tracking the eyes from any camera is most of your depth can come from motion parallax. So if that was a virtual object and, Sean, and we're tracking where Sean's eyes are, we'd project this like this, like the street chalk paintings. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And if Sean moves over here, It'll change. we change the projection. Uh -huh. So we can have the whole landscape without goggles. God. It's a single person effect. Or you can have a mound here and everyone gets on one side of the table, and these are my surfaces. Oh, God. And Sean, this is all yours, baby. You can project it. <laughs> and, and, and that part of the mountain. Wow. And so you can have, this could be the Ventura Mountains here, or the wow. ocean. For stuff that, but I really prefer stuff that are, is on an actual surface because they're touchable yeah. and interactive. Wow. Oh, my God, man. It's hard. It's just so many... It's, yeah, so it's, it's hard to re reconceptualize how to think about stuff. So, so here's the what you normally get out of your right. photogrammetry right, in right, the right. browser, yep. right, in the rail yard, yep. which we got. But now when you're in a, a case like this where you have these images coming in, but where are they? Right? Yep. So that's what we're showing here. Here's the camera pose that we can solve for mm -hmm. and where it actually is. And if I hide the image and see the model, that means if I click on this pixel, I have X, Y, Z for that pixel mm. or any kind of machine vision, right? <sighs> and now we're gonna project that pixels into the model and have a live. Updated, yeah, wow. Model, right, and that's a, a fix, but if we were. Holy cow, man. So here's a video. And then project it on the model. Oh man. In the browser. Oh man. Or here's my son's video. And now if we pause, and you have now think of the AVL data that maybe the fire department has, so they're labeling their cars through any camera that's available. And now we miss that car, but now we're gonna simulate that car car as a ghost particle, right? And now it's gonna you know, maybe show up over here again. Huh. Or here's that drone, uh, uh, we're looping it, so we're projecting it onto the scene with the live data. It has the tilt shift, so it's blurry. Wow. But that could be the live camera feeds. Wow. And we think there's a whole thing around live tiles that, even that's 18 megapixels, when someone's viewing it, if you pyramid that out, you might just send the low res tiles until they really zoom in and yeah, let yeah, people yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Be a, um, a steward for their area with their browsers or plug in another terabyte drive and serve it up. The more data is used locally, the more data is stored locally in that area or even in this lab, right? Hmm. Wow. That is absolutely crazy. Oh, yeah. Two more things. Okay. So when an event happens these days, you know, here's what's on social media. Starting up from another screen here. Ignore that. 
right? So you can say, here's an ammonia release in Brazil. Click on here, here's what that person's seen. So that was all hmm. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Hmm. And now it's solvable where that, actually where that camera is. But also, imagine the fire department says, I need everything in a GIS above here and not give the backyard data. I mean, that would be surveillance. Yeah. And the end user doesn't have to go home and mask, mask that out. So here's a, here's a sodium cyanide explosion in China. In the old days, this would have been uploaded, but now it's live streaming. Six hundred people are going to die in this event. To be a smart city, adaptive, resilient community, you need to know where that is and change your traffic immediately. Not go wait for a seismic. And you don't have time for that 911 to come in. People need to hold up their phones and have intel and give you intel. It's command and control thinking to say we're going to tell people what to do. Exactly. And there's enough information where you should pre-plan and know where your telephone poles are. And have calibrated cameras so if you see this, that camera is getting calibrated based on it. So, like we're showing this, I think we, uh, do we show this with you, uh, Sean? No. no so here's mean. like the Thomas fire. Everyone's refreshing their browser every five minutes, but they're only getting a perimeter once a day. <laughs> right, exactly. That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the Hayden Pass fire, and it's blowing east. Here's Colorado Springs and Canyon City. We need to know where that thing is in the first five hours. By the time we get a perimeter, it's already out of the forest. It's not even an issue anymore. But here's where people die. The Atlas fire, the Gatlinburg fire. And here's what's coming in on social media. This, these people are looking west from uh, Fort Carson and Ken, uh, Colorado Springs. So these people are pretty much uh, Canyon City, Fort Carson, and Colorado Springs looking west into the fire on social media. Here's someone closer in. Here's a citizen filming looking a little northwestish. Hmm. But, but notice the altitude and azimuth of the sun is a constraint of where that camera can be. Yep. Or finding where, you know, this that little shed thing is, is, yeah. right? Or here's a journalist close in. Here's someone on a river. And that machine vision, you should know that it's a river. Or people just tag and say, I'm from here. I know where that bridge is and that culvert, right? And find those points. Here's, in this era, astronaut Astro underscore Jeff on the space station tweeting live <laughs> yeah. that this is the... Hayden yeah. Pass fire, and he's seeing a spot near Fort Carson. A spot fire. And you can tweet him and say, This is my 70 millimeter. He can say, This is my 70 millimeter lens. This is my 700. Here's a woman flying over, flying east from San Francisco. And then a little crowdsourced sleuthing that's United. There's only two flights in the area. Here is then the KML. So she's on the SFO to DC <laughs> and Reagan. <laughs> oh, man. Right? And here's her KML. Let me come back to here. Wow. So that's her, her KML, that little uh, magenta line. That's a error, a constraint, constraint with error. Yep, but totally. we're solving now for her camera, not the plane of where she is. Oh, man. And wow. That's, and that's the perimeter a day later. Holy cow. And now you can say, what, do, what am I dealing with here as a polyline? or polygon and say, how many schools or factories do I have? Is Howard a better staging area than Canyon City? And now what are the winds doing, right? And now if we come in here, here's that person on the bridge. And you can see that foreground mountain. Wow. Uh. And every pixel now has lat long and elevation, right? And like we were doing those features, if you can track just like I was tracking me, there's enough right. texture in that. Totally. Now we have a 2D vector, and that's a velocity constraint that it has to keep the same velocity from this other view. Now you have a 3D vector field. And, and learning about, learning convection is the name of the game in fire now, instead of these surface spread models, especially when we have these massive fires. And then lastly, this we call this, there is no goat, and it's a joke like, <laughs> when, you make, when you make a model that was of a goat with um, um, image-based rendering, if you have the images in your cameras already, you've already rendered it. Nature's rendered it for you. It's just how do I transition 
between the images, there's no reason to have a model. So here's an example. We have a whole bunch of images, and here's my virtual view in red. And now we have some point, just some basic point spreads just to show you kind of the basis of that. And so you move the red camera, you're sampling from the four nearest cameras mm. live. And that, mm. those could be video. So you're not rendering the scene. It's, it's capturing a portion of what's it's called a feed. the light field. It's like so a feed, yeah. At every point, there's all these theoretical rays coming into this point, And we're really just sampling it from everyone. We're a bunch of... We're all holding this is up, capturing the light field, and now how do you image-based render between them without making a model all the time? So you can see as that red camera's moving, here's, think of a ray coming back and sampling from each one of those. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, associated with uh, Eric Frost down at SDS2 too, very uh, sweet man, and uh, professor at SFI too, just during their summer school. If you have graduate students, that's a great, uh, summer program, they learn about model, agent-based modeling, and yep. just before you, so it doesn't sound crazy, I'll just, or complicated, <laughs> here's